Welcome everyone to the Facets of Change Roundtable discussion at Lacuna Festivals 2023. Uh, the program was put together by Althea Mali, Deborah Ruth, and yours truly, Martin Pongratz. And we also have a special guest here, Ed Kemplar. Today we are going to discuss the themes of uh, metamorphosis and change, which are the main things of this year's Lacuna Festival. And this is why we organized this event. So now I give the word to Deborah, who will give the housekeeping instructions. Thank you. So what we're going to do is introduce some of the topics along with our special guest who's there. And afterwards, we'll open everything up for discussion. And we really welcome everyone to become involved and join in. So what we were thinking is that people can put their questions and comments in the chat box. And then um, as, as the ideas come up, put them in, and then we'll get to them afterwards, after we do all the introductions, um, and ask you to elaborate if you want. Um, and the, the last housekeeping issue is please uh, mute your microphones when you're not talking. Thank you. Um, and so now it's part for the introducing. And uh, yeah, I just want to add that we don't have any guests yet, but I think we can carry on since we are recording and maybe they can watch it back later. Uh, yeah, I think that perhaps because of the timing, um, it's going to be difficult to have live guests today. Um, but we've been getting lots of action on our YouTube channel. And I've actually had some questions through the, um, the old social media about the event tonight. So I can dig those out whilst you're starting the discussion. And then um, I can feed those in as as and when is appropriate. Sure. Sounds good. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> yeah, so just a quick uh, in introduction from the artists before we start. So I'm Martin Pongratz, Budapest-based creative artist. I'm mostly interested in uh, moving motion picture and still pictures and the relationship between these two. And I also like to experiment with new technologies and mix that with the already existing ones. And beside that, I believe there's always more meaning. And I try to put that into my works as well. I'm Deborah from Canada. I'm interested in the radical possibilities of figurative painting. And I also write on cultural politics and the arts. This is my second year at Lacuna and I'm very happy to be working with Altea and Martin. Altea. Hello, I'm Althea, Buenos Aires. Um, I'm a metaphysical, cultural and visionary artist from Australia, currently residing in Udine, Italy. Uh, my work's a narrative with allegorical layers that express our intrinsic human experience from a variety of different cultures. In my spare time, I'm also a surf coach, massage therapist, yoga teacher and writer for Intriesta magazine. This is my first year participating in Lacuna Festivals, and I'm thrilled to be part of this revolutionary idea with like-minded artists and visionaries. And we also have our special guest, Ed, here. Hello, um, I'm Ed, and um, I write a little bit. <laughs> uh, basically, I think I was, uh, I've been invited along because I'm a long-time resident and I've been living on Lanzarote for a long time. And I've written a book, which is basically, uh, it ties in quite nicely to the theme of the Lacuna Festival this year, Metamorphosis, which is uh, uh, the book I've written was about a great transition between the old world and the new world. So it ties in quite nicely with the theme that you're all discussing. And we're going to dig into that very, very soon. We're going to dig into it very, very soon. In fact, you want a picture first? Should we show you a picture before we start? Yeah, it has a... <laughs> oh, there's a table just collapsed next door. And before that, Althea, please um, introduce us to the main theme of the discussion. Absolutely. 
So just a brief introduction of what we'll be discussing today. So metamorphosis has been the epitome of intrigue throughout the ages with its elusive and multi-layered phenomena, continuing today to influence artists, philosophers, scientists worldwide. It's an intangible idea that takes on its own variety of shapes and forms in the external and internal worlds and can be viewed from a variety of lenses. When one thinks about metamorphosis in terms of the natural world, usually the caterpillar transforming into a butterfly arises. Although symbolically powerful, there is a grander meaning to its notion. We can observe metamorphosis as physical attributions through the passage of temporal evolution, such as birth, life, death, and growth, or in the drastic alterations of landscapes by the erupting forces of mother nature or human and animal intervention. Historically, it has been depicted in ancient fables where gods and humans supernaturally shapeshift into animals and other beings, transcribing wisdom and morale. If we turn our gaze inwards, we will find our own internal transformations through liberation of the psyche. This may come about by a studious philosophical practice, life challenges, spiritual discipline, leaving one's homeland or other major personal developments. A shift in perspective might emerge with strikes of inspiration, spiritual insight, or changes in behavioral patterns and identity. We may feel somehow changed and never to be the same again. Undoubtedly, metamorphosis can be found in every subject and under every leaf turned is a natural process of life. Thank you, Althea. I hope uh, now it's clear or a bit more clearer for everyone what we are going to discuss. Uh, first, we are going to bring up the first topic of the discussion, which is local history and the metamorphosis and change at Lanzarote. And then Deborah and Althea will introduce some other topics as well. So please, Ed, yeah. let's dig into that now. Let's dig into it. OK, when I was first. Uh... When I was first approached to talk at this table about metamorphosis in relation to this island, um, I was honoured thinking it would give me an opportunity to uh, to flog a few copies of my book. Uh, but thinking about it, I realised that this island, and in fact the whole archipelago, is a wonderful example of constant metamorphosis or change, as I prefer to say, as my tongue gets tied if I try and say metamorphosis too often. So... If we, uh, if we go back and try to sift through the history in a very short few minutes, um, we have to travel back right to the very beginning, which is approximately 20 million years ago, probably on a Tuesday. The first Lanzarote peaks pushed up through the surface of the Atlantic Ocean. The first born were on the Apache Range, uh, the mountains at the southern tip of Lanzarote, later followed by um, the ones at Fumara. And then over subsequent years, thousands of years, more volcanoes pushed up through the water and created the island pretty much as we know it today. What we have here on Lanzarote, which is quite unique uh, in the world, is a biosphere where it's possible to see in one small concentrated location a combination of natural elements which have come together over time to create an organic, carbon-rich biodome. We can actually see the blueprint of how Mother Nature worked to convert the elements of fire, earth, wind, and water in order to create all life on Earth. That is, of course, if you believe that Mother Nature created life on Earth and it wasn't some god-type load. Um, who just did it in six days, of course. If it is the case that you think it's some god bloke, then maybe look away now for a few more minutes. Uh, I, I will borrow some God-type words to start off um, the history of Lanzarote. In the beginning, when the island was formed, it would be very difficult to imagine anything being able to grow on the sharp, black, jagged rocks spewed from the depths of the earth. The raw materials are stirred in a molten core, a place where the temperature is as high as on the surface of the sun. But eventually the rocks on the surface cooled sufficiently to allow organic matter to settle without being burnt to a crisp. Lichen arrived. 
like colonists from a science fiction movie. These strange plants are strange organisms. Neither plants nor fungi, but a combination of them both, were blown across the sea and landed on the volcanic rocks. They grew very slowly and began the long, hard process of transforming the volcanic rock into earth with the ability to support rooted organic life. Even now, you can see virgin lichen, young lichen, uh, like random splotches of paint splattered across the northern faces of black rocks on the island, activated and fed by the moisture-bearing trade winds from the north. The lichens consume the virgin volcanic rock, which is rich in minerals, working with the wind, sun and rain to break the rock up. When the lichen eventually reaches the end of its life cycle, as long as 5,000 years old in some cases, its organic mass adds to the soil generated by the weathered rocks. The subsequent earth is rich in nutrients, very nitrogen rich, perfect for other plant life to find somewhere to put down roots. Plant life arrived by airmail, dropped by birds on runs from land masses near and far. I've never seen this, well, I've actually seen thistles growing on the island from the Scottish Highlands. And we've got some strange succulent plants that are native to the Canary Islands, adapted from other species of plant life, shat by migrant birds. The, um, the plant life, it speeds up the process of breaking down the rocks and creating an organic, living, breathing soil, virgin soil. There are vast fields of the stuff behind the cliffs of Fumara and in the high valleys of Femmes. Under the Pecan, the valley of La Heria is a rich seam of soil, and it's provided the island with an abundance of nutrient-rich land which, on which to grow fruit and vegetables. Apparently, at the moment, the only crops they seem to grow these days the grapes for wine production. I suspect that's because humans need to get drunk as often as possible to nullify themselves to the shite state the planet's in at the moment. But enough of that. That's um, I've, I've not come to give you a lecture in sociology. That can come at another time. So, soil. The island changed physically because of all this erosion. The mountains are actually shrinking. Uh, all the way through this process of weathering and soiling. If you walk on some of the older volcanoes, it almost feels spongy underfoot. It's hard to believe they were once as forbidding as the sharp, dark peaks in the Timon Fire National Parks, where the new mountains appeared a short 300 years ago. It's been speculated that the Ahachi Mountains, the ones at the south, the original mountains, are only as half as tall as they were when they originally came out of the earth. This was Mother Nature's grand design. The volcanoes eventually turned green, supporting life which grows from nothing without any human intervention at all. Or so it was around here for approximately 19,999,400 years. And that's when things started to change once more. More rapidly as people began to interfere with Mother Nature's grand design, the humans were busy bashing the shit out of each other all over the world uh, while paradise was being created here in the Atlantic Ocean. Indeed, one of those warring tribes of humans were the first to record the existence of the Canary Islands around the turn of the first millennium. The Romans recorded the existence of the Canary Islands according to a chap called Pliny the Elder, the first century Roman author and philosopher who claimed the islands were uninhabited when visited by Hanno the Navigator, his name was, he claimed that ruins of great buildings were seen from the ships, which is kind of dubious, but considering that um, Pliny, the, Pliny the Elder also claimed that there were small fish that could stop warships with their sucky big lips, it's uh, everything he says is kind of a little bit dubious there. The Romans didn't find any natives on the island 2,000 years ago. But that doesn't mean there weren't any at the time. Volcanic rock has one property uh, that helped the shy inhabitants, inhabitants of the island hide whenever danger approached. The rock, when it comes out of the earth, is extremely porous. It literally boils as it comes to the surface, creating bubbles in its structure as it solidifies. It's been said that there are enough caves under the islands 
to hide the entire population. Now, I mean, sometimes I can't find my car keys in the living room. So it's, uh, it's, it's easy to believe that the Romans couldn't find anybody on an island this large. The nickname for the people of Lanzarote is Conajeros. Uh, Conajeros is a derivative of the word rabbit in Spanish, which implies there was uh, some hiding going on underground considering rabbits didn't get introduced to the island for at least 100 years after the first invaders came. The origin of the inhabitants of the island, the first indigenous uh, people on the island, is in doubt. It's said to be uh, from the, the Berber area of the northern Sahara and in Morocco. Other people have said that it could possibly be uh, people from Atlantis and that uh, the archipelago was originally Atlantis which explains why the indigenous people didn't transfer themselves between the islands because they were afraid of the water. So every island had its own indigenous population and they didn't communicate, they didn't share a language. But one thing that the people in Lanzarote did do was um, share a god with many other indigenous people at the time. They believed in the mother and the sun not Christian versions, but nature, nature's mother and son, which is the sun and the moon, basically kept them alive. But also the mother in a different way, because women were venerated by the, um, the original inhabitants of, uh, uh, <laughs> of Lanzarote. There wasn't enough to go around. Archaeologists speculate as to why there were a great a number of males than females. Some suggest it was Mother Nature selecting what sex of a child was born and chose males as the land couldn't support too many births. Others have claimed that females weren't as desirable as males because there was a lot of heavy lifting to be done. Now, I'm not agreeing with either of these things, and I know how hard women work, so I didn't say anything. Um, but there were... Uh, they practiced on the island a form of uh, polygamy, whereby a woman would have as many as three husbands, and it was <laughs> it was actually the, the work was shared in the family environment. So basically, uh, they would take it in turns every moon cycle, every month. One man would sleep with the wife. The other would work and serve that couple, and the third man would have a month off. Some would say it was an idyllic existence. It was a peaceful life of live and let live. But let's not forget that these, these people were still humans. They got bored easily and fought. Indeed, only a short time before the Norman invasion of 1400, the island was split into two, the north and the south, and they often fought against each other. They carried weapons, even though they had no predators to defend themselves against, it was to fight each other. They carried fire-hardened spears called binnets, knives made from obsidian and stone, and slings for launching rocks, and a weapon called a tenike, which was a leather rope with a heavy stone tied to one end. It's perfect for bashing each other around the head, but when the invaders arrived, in steel armor, they didn't have a chance. And before long, the island changed once more. Um, yeah, are we? Okay. Anyway, seeing as we were now out of time, it's all in there, basically the time of the invaders. Um, so the invaders brought with them steel, gold, and commerce. And this is where the island changed again. So basically it became rather than a, a, a place where you exist along with Mother Nature, it became a place where you traded and bought and sold. And that leads us to where we are today, where agriculture uh, took over for a great many of years. Um, 
and we got to a point in the mid 70s where we lost agriculture to tourism and the power of the pound the power of the dollar and tourism meant that many of the locals left their fields and went to work in the tourist resorts and the land changed once more one example this is the last example i'm going to give i promise and then then i'll i'll shut up and go away but basically um there is one place at the north of the island called the cactus gardens it was a place created by a local artist and architecture called cesar manrique and it has examples of cactuses from all over the world but the fields around the cactus garden was the old industrial base where they produced cochineal to dye for export all over the world now those fields are dying while the tourist field is thriving it's quite a sad state and it is quite upsetting but what can you do um basically progress as far as this island is concerned has been motivated by um economics which is kind of ironic considering it's um it's an island that was born from fire and is a perfect example of how the world has become the paradise it could be so talking of history did i mention to you that i'd, that I'd written a book <laughs> I'm going to show up now and go away and uh, leave it to you guys and uh, I'll be here. Yeah, but I will have some questions to you after the others uh, gave their speeches as well and introduced their topics. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. No worries. Thank you. Now it's Deborah's turn. And I have some questions too. That's incredibly interesting. I live in a tourist paradise and the local people are pushed out. The agriculture is pushed out for wine. So. Yeah, progress. Um, so um, we've been thinking about the how the concept of metamorphosis can be uh, understood through the figure of Morpheus in the Greek mythology. So Morpheus is the god of dreams, bringing us insight from the visual fragments and metaphors we experience in the dream state. That, that transformation comes out of dreams is understood by shamans and artists across the globe, at least traditional ones, you know, because they, they pay special attention to that. Um, because in the dream states, we're able to access insights and connections that aren't as apparent in our mundane existence. In many traditions, the strongest energies are seen to be located in the process of becoming and what happens in between things. So not just the thing, you know, there's life, there's death, and then there's what's in between, animal, human, and what's in between. Um, and in the arts, we can see this in images of mythological figures, which can be composites of many elements, um, and hence things that are in between. We are interested in how the process of metamorphosis is enhanced by dreaming, and how the process of creativity is opened up by dreams. What can we learn from the partial? What can we learn from the unfinished and from the in-between? Okay, and uh, Althea has some ideas. So another subject um, we're contemplating to talk about this evening or morning, depending where you are, um, is psychology, spirituality, and myth. So psychology, spirituality, and myth all play a prominent role in metamorphosis with each influencing each other. In various Eastern philosophies and religions, the material world is often regarded to be in a constant state of flux with one thing affecting the other. Nothing is ever stagnant and everything is evolving. This notion can be specifically found in the Buddhist doctrine impermanence. Nothing lasts forever and everything eventually decays. Throughout our lives, even the cells in our bodies completely change, which begs the question, are we ever the same? The thought experiment, the ship of Theseus, is a prime example of this, a Greek myth that has held up throughout the ages about the ancient founder and king of Athens, Theseus. 
Throughout the years, to maintain the decaying ship, many parts were replaced. This thus posed a paradoxical question to philosophers. With the replaced parts of the ship, was the ship of Theseus still the same ship? In spirituality, we find this same concept of transformation. Through discipline and rigor, we may transform our psyches into new ways of thinking. We may overcome old modes of perspectives that are no longer beneficial and metamorphosize them into a fresh and new way of being. Life challenges and difficulties can provide lessons to be learned and old cycles to change. If we allow, we'll transform like the phoenix, time and time again, becoming better versions of ourselves, a more compassionate and wiser being. I encourage you all now to take a moment and to close your eyes and think about your life's journey. Think about when you were a child. Now as a teenager, as an adult, and as you are now. And open your eyes. Think about the challenges you've overcome and how this has transformed you into a new being. We encourage discussions on this phenomenon at the end. Another subject we are contemplating is um, arguably one of the most controversial topics in the art for this modern era, AI art. <laughs> we see metamorphosis throughout the passage of art from various pivotal eras and movements of history. And as artists, we depict the notions of our time. Currently, we have a new era moving forward as we step out into our new beginnings after the recent coronavirus with a newfound generation of AI art. There are a variety of different perspectives about this new technology. And Martin will share his now. Yeah, basically, I was thinking about AI that it completely, it could be like a complete game changer or uh, just bring art into a very, very different direction because uh, it cannot work independently yet. And artists, I believe, are quite independent beings. This is why they choose this path. And uh, AI without the guidance of, of an artist cannot generate real art. And also all the data and knowledge that is uh, currently put into AI and which it, it pro processes are, uh, are already existing uh, styles and uh, several isms that were in the part of, like part of art history. But uh, if you wanted to create something revolutionary new, it couldn't do it because it only sees what happened but uh, it can process a huge amount of themes and topics. I was even uh, ex like experimenting with it today. And I can show you later some, uh, some examples for that. And it works surprisingly fast, but you will see that uh, it, has, it, it still needs to develop if we want to work with it. Yeah, or I can even show show it now. Or I think you had some themes here as well, Althea, for the AI and uh, how the whole art world is changing, basically. Yeah, so I believe AI, AI art can be a tool. Like anything, it can be used for good or evil. In the sense, I think it could drastically enhance artists' practices and create advancements in the field. I think the most important thing is to be adaptable, but also not to become lazy. Amazing art can now be created with just a few prompt words, as you're saying now, Martin. Um, but it's important for us to still be a part of that creative process. Yeah, so if you I... want, I, I can share the screen quickly because I had three examples and I'll show, show them to you. That's okay. Sure, sure. And then I think, Deborah, would you like to say a few words on AI art as well? 
the only thing I want to say is that I am completely uninterested. (laughs) I'm more, I'm more interested in what happens to artists, what the life of artists are. I know artists my age who are quite senior, who can't, you know, in terms of how important they are, who can't make rent. So who's getting paid? What's the economy of the art? So that's what I think about it. So when I see AI, I just think who's making money? But you guys know more, you've actually done it. And I look forward to seeing these pictures that you created, Martin. Yeah, and it's surprisingly easy if you if you ask me. I mean, if you're an artist, I think you should struggle for what 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 you put out there. There should be a journey in it. And I don't really feel that there was like a real journey in these uh, images, but I show them you now very quickly. There are three examples. Can you can you see it now? So this was the first example. I don't know if you see the four images that were generated by AI. I just in the first row you can see the instruction I gave to the AI based on the theme of the festival and uh, the phoenix, the fire element. And it also resonates with your work, Althea, I think. And also the butterfly, which resonates with the festival. And yeah, these are the results. I don't really see any phoenixes, maybe on, on the most left one. Um, bastard, love the of a phoenix on a butterfly by the look of it, isn't it really? Yeah. And the other one, here I give uh, another instruction to show the butterfly and the phoenix on a Canary Island landscape. But you see, there's no phoenix at all here. But uh, I think the AI AI could generate the landscape pretty nicely. Also the wind turbines, which are pretty frequent here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And one more example, I took a still from uh, one of my films, which you can see on the left hand side. Left hand side, and then I asked uh, the AI, which is Dolly, which was Dolly in this case, to generate very similar uh, pictures, and these are the results. Yeah. They're not I have a bad. question. I have a question to put. I mean, to uh, I, my history is I, I make television programs and I write music as well. And uh, we're stuck at the moment in a very, uh, in a society which we've virtually turned into a post post modern society. And my question for the subject of AI at the moment is AI the next step in our, our evolution, or is it merely the closing? stages in a postmodern world because we're always going to need new creation and I haven't seen anything from an AI perspective that says to me new it's always a rejig of something else so I'd, I'd be interested to know what anybody else thought about that don't you think a lot of music's like that as well nowadays the, the music that gets super promoted it's all regurgitated, formulated stuff. Yeah. I mean, are you a fan at all, uh, or have you seen uh, Black Mirror by no, uh, Charlie Brooker on the TV? No. He actually, in an interview before the as the new series came out, uh, was suggesting, he, he, well, he said in the interview that he got AI to write one of the episodes. And basically all it was was black mirror form but there was nothing new Uh, so that is basically where i see ai in the artist world in the art world in the music world in every world it's just basically rearranging the molecules of what already what already exists but don't you feel like as an artist that's kind of whether you're an artist, a musician, a writer, like, do you ever have a truly original idea? I don't believe you do. It might be an idea that you haven't personally encountered before, 
but in the history of humans has that idea never been encountered before by someone else whether or not they've acted upon it I doubt it I don't know I just feel like it's another version of it in a machine rather than a person with that in mind do we need to be scared of AI then I would watch I Am Mother on Netflix and then and then see what you think. <laughs> I don't know. I really don't know. I mean, it's something that I've been thinking about, um, particularly actually these past couple of weeks, because Simon and I were invited to a conference all about AI um, that was held in Arecife. And um, it was overwhelmingly positive, actually. All of the artists and designers who were there were there to talk about how they were using AI and kind of integrating it into their model of practice to make themselves more efficient and therefore like make art and design more affordable for the masses. Like the kind of democratization of art, you know? Like, I don't know if that is something that is a good or a bad metamorphosis. Can metamorphosis be bad? I don't know. I'm just generating more questions here rather than any answers, so I'm going to mute and let you guys move on. Can I just come in there? It's Elaine here. Yes. Can you hear me? Hi, Elaine. Yeah, come, please. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so um, it's great to hear the debate. And, um, yeah, I think there's a sense, I think um, I'd sort of probably mirror what Deborah was saying about... Um, I think it could be another tool, but I also don't think, um, I mean, there's there's been quite a lot of questions around um, wh whether AI can think for itself. I mean, that, uh, uh, you know, that's still, uh, th I've seen, I've seen some artwork that is, is quite, you know, quite developed actually, and sort of like a, a dreamscape, um, quite interesting i do think it, it it could be an interesting tool but at the same time um i don't know that that there's so many artists that that can't yeah that that aren't making much money and and so it's it feels like putting foundations it's almost like we're kind of building kind of castles in this in the sky and we still haven't got our roots firmly in the ground as arts communities and actually um, and and I think it's 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 a lot to do with money. It's going to be a it's it's going to be a tool for um, yeah. It's already is um, uh, people making uh, is it are they called it uh, not F NFTs? Is it NFT? Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. The NFT, yeah. yeah. NFTs. Yeah. There's a lot of you know it, it's for the big it's for the it's for the you know the the big global companies people who have lots and lots of money um it's it's a gadget it's a tool it's another con i think i mean i i'm really interested in in kind of new technologies but i i i'm i'm not that interested in this because um i'm very much interested in visceral experiences and i don't think if i spend too long on a computer i get a headache to be quite honest with you so if it means tying people to boxes and becoming automated as a world um you know like all of the all of the sci-fi films have all predicted this kind of stuff that's happening right now i think we have to be awake and we have to be aware of what is going on and who's going to make money out of it i think it's a, a it's to do with money finance big global companies um anyway i'm sure it, it, it's an interesting subject though <laughs> i i have a related comment which is could i stop were... the screen share in the meanwhile say that again yeah ah. i'll just stop the screen share oh okay I'm... so i can come on the camera no okay i think that um a related issue has to has to do with what you said about the visceral and the you know Ed Ed was talking about the island being um, the, a bit, having uh, changes in the environment through volcanoes and this and that and the different kinds of the different ways people inhabited it, and the traditional people on the island like everywhere lived close to the land, um, and somehow in modernity we imagine that being 
outside of the land, outside of our bodies as somehow better. But the reality is we die, the earth dies. Look at what the temperatures are like. Look, look at this and that. And I often feel it's because we don't really pay attention to the basic stuff. And um, as you were saying about everyone connected to their boxes, it's a way to not be connected. Like I can spend too much time on my phone looking stuff up. And then if I go outside and walk around, I have a very different experience. And I think if artists are getting their creativity from the land or from their actual lived experience or from their bodies or whatever, it's inevitably going to be more interesting than if it's from a machine. A machine can be a tool, but it's not, we give, we give machines too much credit in my view. Yeah, I would totally agree with everything you just said. Yeah, like, I guess the word I would use is a bit different, but like our soul, you know, it comes from within, from that shared experience, from, you know, everything that, you know, is around us. And I totally agree. I'm more traditional artist. I prefer like tactile, hands-on, you know, being in that moment, whereas I feel very much the same where technology takes me away from my own practice so I use it as a tool like we were saying but I don't like to go into it too much I, I want to feel more from my heart and share that onto a canvas so yeah yeah I would like to add one more thing and that's meaning so I think with AI you can generate so many things that uh, you can't think consciously and come to create consciously. And uh, I think this is also very connected to machineries and uh, the Mahina itself, uh, which is don't really think, just act what it, pro what it was programmed to do. And uh, AI works like this as well. You can create so many things with it, but uh, I think after a while it's going to become like oh, like a, a complete overstimulation, and uh, which doesn't really has meaning or like new meaning, because it's all based on what was already said or declared. You're muted, Deborah. Yeah. Sorry. In a way, this relates to Charlie's question, which he put in the chat. Um, uh, about half an hour ago, I'll read it to you. He said, thank you for the interesting history, Ed. I'm just thinking, does the metamorphosis of the context we live in influence the art we make? So the art is different in different time periods in different cultures because the art is naturally a product of the context it is made in. So if what we're seeing now is like the machinic regurgitation and it's all about money, that that does tell us something about the context in which we live. But I don't know if other people, if you, Ed, or if any of you want to talk about the the way art is produced within its social and political context. It's very difficult because uh, the... Um, I'll go back to television again. Um, I mean, art... Uh, as um, as an as, as an experience to like touch the senses, uh, to make you to make to be tactile, to make you want to touch it, to make you want to taste it sometimes. And then some of the most popular programs in the television world are cooking programs. Now, what's the most important thing about food? Is the way it touches, is the way it tastes, is the way it smells. And yet these are incredibly important programs on the television, but you can neither taste nor smell it. So are we fooling with our senses? With AI? Are we changing the actual, is, is the thing that's actually metamorphosing, metamorphosis is saying, is that the actual human experience? And I'd like yeah. to come back to, can I just say, well, there was a, you talked about dreaming and the dream state. And um, as humans, to allow ourselves to go into that space, um, 
that's the sort of connecting to our higher power. Um, that's not connecting to anything outside of ourselves. That's going inward and finding that pathway inward and listening and, and listening and not connecting up to, I'm not saying that, that that could possibly, I'm sure that could be used for dream states or what have you, but, but the raw basic state of just going inward and using you see our brains are these incredible computer chips we don't need all that other shit sorry but <laughs> you know i mean great yeah use computers but our we have this incredible tool to that we could use we can use but instead we're going outside of our bodies and using these kind of machines in in, in a sort of to replace our brains and our brains we, we have no idea of what we could do um you know and and we started to get near to that i suppose in the 60s and in times when there's been great enlightenment but um uh yeah i think uh we're at we're at a really important time right now on the planet because um you know we can give our power away to this or we can really be very very bounded around it and we as our children are struggling with this stuff i mean it's been proven that we hold our breath all the time that we're on computers we can we forget to breathe because it's so stimulating it's what Ma martin just said something about that overstimulation um yeah anyway sorry just thought i throw that in Could I um, briefly come in? There's like something that, um, yeah, there's a, like we're trading in our brains for computers and such a small part of our brain is actually understood and kind of used and researched and, and studied, et cetera, et cetera. And it kind of reminds me a little bit about how we're living in our environment as well. It's like, we still haven't discovered the very deepest parts of the ocean but let's go to Mars and see if we can live there because we're screwing up where we're living. Like there's kind of, there's kind of like a, a mirror there, you know, what, what we're doing to ourselves and what we're doing to the place that we're, we're living in. And, and I think that um, in modernity and maybe it's part of computers too, we do think in very short bursts. I've always thought humans are so short sighted. We can't see the big picture. But where I live in Eastern Canada, it's the home of the Anishinaabe people um, who, who still live here. And um, in their tradition, any decision you make about land or anything you're gonna do, you're supposed to think seven generations ahead. And everyone just assumes you, you do that. And for me, because I didn't grow up in that tradition, it's almost impossible to think even one generation ahead. But this is how they lived in harmony with the land for so long until the colonials came. But I think we have so much to learn from these other traditions who did not um, at the time have machines. I think of uh, uh, the Yoruba people who were so good at divination, you know, and then some of the people from Siberia who were so good at like shamanistic practices. And yeah, we in modernity, machines get built, but it's not the only thing of human experience. Yeah, but if you think seven generations ahead, like how can you live in the present? It sounds like very, like living in the future, like always thinking ahead. And it's well, also- this is for decisions. Sorry? This is for decisions. So let's say you think, okay, we need more power or whatever. So we're going to dam a river. And then you kind of imagine the implications of what that would be like for your grandchildren, their grandchildren, and their grandchildren. So it doesn't mean people don't make decisions or do stuff. And at the same time, you, you do live in the present, I think, according to my friends who've talked about this with me. Um, it's not a contradiction. You just do both simultaneously. 
We have so much to learn from Indigenous cultures and we're at a time, again, where we're on a sort of juggernaut, uh, you know, steaming ahead. And I love the idea that, um, you know, I think that what, what needs to be cultivated is is finding ways to, to relate as communities how we can come together and um, there's a lot of dissatisfaction, there's war, there's because... Yeah. You know, you know, at the moment in our in this country in the UK, decisions get made and people don't agree with those decisions. I mean, there's a voting process, but that seems to be quite um, um, rigged at times. And so, surely we need to be working more towards again the sort of idea of a basic, basic, go back to basics, not um, uh, choosing something that most people are disempowered from. I mean, the elderly. Uh, you know, we had to teach. Luckily, we got my mum on. Um, so there are great tools like FaceTime. Um, but there's a lot of elderly that couldn't get and, you know, didn't know how to work computers. So they're kind of pushed out of society. So it's quite elite, this this sort of, um, you know, this idea of AI. And um, yeah. Yeah. Yes. And I taught in an art college for many years. And my students were, um, uh, some of them had different kinds of learning disorders in terms of writing, writing essays or dealing with math and that sort of thing. But they were incredibly good at what they at, at um, what they did. But they were getting pushed out for two reasons. One is if they wanted to do well, they had to be able to write elaborate theoretical essays about their work. And had they wanted to do that, they probably wouldn't have come, become artists in the first place. And then just because of a kind of economic thing, it all switched over to design. So people had to work for, people were being trained to work for corporations, basically. And yeah, you can get work in a way you can't if you're making like performance art or something, but they're not the same thing. And, and it was sad because a lot of the students really got pushed out, even though they were very good at what they did do. We actually had the same thing happen at the university I was studying at. They did an overhaul of the curriculum and they based it on trading jobs. So you can imagine what the, you know, criteria was. And yeah, a lot of uh, teachers left or the lecturers left. And uh, I think we were left with about 20% of the students um, in the final year. So, Yeah. <laughs> So Lacuna says they have some questions from the artists to read out and give me a shout when you want one. Yes, please read them out. Okay, so these are questions that have either come up at different points, like in different events or things that have been sent directly. So I'll read one and then you can answer it. And then, you know, depending on how much time we have, we'll see how many um, we get through. So um, recently we had a presentation by artist Bianca Turner who has a background in bioengineering. Um, and she presented a project uh, called 30, Back to 3022. Um, and she wants to know what you think the art world will be like in 3023. So in a thousand years from now, how will things have changed and how will things have stayed the same, if anything? I think the first thought is if if we're still here, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, that's a very tough question. A thousand years, well, look how much has changed in a thousand years, you know, uh, just recently, or even a hundred years. I don't think I could answer that to be honest. Yeah, <laughs> I think we'll be living. The remnants of humanity will be living in caves, trying to get by. Thus, what we'll see our cave paintings, going back to the beginning from the Paleolithic. Like, what do you mean by art world? You mean the art market or you mean self-expression? Or like, because I think like art world in itself can be a hard thing to, to like find a definition for it. It's like, so it has so many layers. Yeah, I think in, even, in even what you do, that can be part of the art world. Yeah. Well, so if, if we go back full circle again, if we're all living in caves again, 
Does art become paintings on walls? <laughs> I think anything's possible. Um, and I think, Mark, on to answer your question, um, I mean, watch Bianca's presentation and sort of take from it what what you will. But my interpretation of it was that it's kind of a bit of both, you know? Like, it's what we're going to make as artists. It's <laughs> also what we're going to sell. Are we going to sell? Is there going to be a need to sell? Because maybe by that point, we won't be living in the same sort of um, economy as we're living in now. So I think she's thinking from a really broad sort of perspective and just kind of considering all of the different possibilities. And she's just really interested in hearing, you know, what other people think around that. I don't think she's expecting you to have like a, so I know for certain in a thousand years, this is exactly what it's going to be like. You know, she's just kind of putting thoughts out there and, and asking for a response. I think it, sorry, um, but I think we're in a very strange place at the moment because in, in all honesty, it feels like we're on, um, as far as uh, speculation for the future goes, we're on a very strange knife edge type of cusp at the moment. And we could go either way. And I think that's why it's very frightening to actually speculate because if you want to be optimistic about the future, it's very hard to be realistic. And that is, unfortunately, where my head goes immediately when you talk about the future, because evidence suggests that we're um, making a damn mess of things. And if we don't sort our acts out very soon, there isn't going to be much of a future. And that makes me think about um, the the importance to say no, the importance to refuse, the importance to, um, you know, we might have to, um, yeah, we might have to um, forego some things that, um, you know, and, and not be part of some groups. But um, it's interesting, many years ago, I went to this spiritual uh, Findhorn Foundation in Scotland, and there was a guy there, Dr. Chet Baker, who, who did this, he, he hypnose, hypnotized, um, I think, I can't remember how many thousand people, and it was a big project, and asked them to envisage the future. And um, uh, a lot of them came up with these sort of different uh sort of different kind of groups, different humanities. Some people were living in domes, some people were um living like Native Americans on the on the land. There were sort of different groups of people. So yeah, I think we have lots of choice actually. We have choices and we can we can choose to not buy into uh things that are going to separate us from each other and things that are gonna um enable powers to be the people with a lot of money to control us um so i think we do have choices i think um charlie has put in the chat yes is there a future not likely the way we are going which you've agreed with deborah um and it's something that i think about a lot is whether the thing that needs to metamorphose is actually our way of thinking about things as humans, we seem to have a bit of an obsession with kind of things being permanent, things lasting for forever, you know? I mean, Mr. T-Rex didn't last forever and he was pretty badass. So I don't understand why we think that we should be any different. Maybe we need to accept that we're not always going to be here and that the future won't have us in it. I don't know. Deborah, you're on mute. Sorry. Yeah, I don't have a problem with that. I don't I think if you look at how human beings lived for most of our existence, so during the various ice ages and so forth, um, it was very much in human in harmony with the land, but even in difficult environments, people didn't work very hard. They worked maybe two hours a day for subsistence. And the rest of the time they made art, they gambled, they hung out, they, they had parties. 
And then once people started settling down and having agriculture, which they didn't really need to do, you started getting power consolidating and then everything changed since then. And you know, the first agricultural societies like the Sumerians, they created a lot of environmental damage, but they didn't really need to. And I'm not saying I personally would be great going and hunting and gathering on the land because I wasn't raised that way. I'd probably starve within five minutes. But the the human condition, like 95% of human existence has been living in harmony with the land. And we got into trouble when we quit doing that. So the future has to be some version of, of going back to that or else we'll all die. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with that um yeah and also the idea of um always needing more I think that's our biggest downfall we have everything we need around us and, and yeah to live a simple life I think is the best thing to do going forward yeah not buying lots of stuff we don't need <laughs> yeah and one more thing I want to highlight here is the island of Lanzarote it's uh, because I think this could be like a very good example of how to live sustainably or like with harmony with the the nature because even though it's a volcanic island and might seem unfertile, they grow some stuff here. And this could be this could be a way like if there would be the end of the world, I would imagine it in a way like a volcanic island and eventually life would grow there and this is what's happening here and there's surprisingly many sustainable energy sources here they use wind energy and solar energy i assume they use the thermal or geothermal energy as well because volcanic soil is very good for them but still i guess they are uh, more focused on tourism I'm not focused on tourism, in all honesty, they're absolutely useless at using um, uh, proper energy. Really? Uh, if, you want the pro if you want a good example of a volcanic island that actually uses geothermal energy, you need to go to Iceland. Okay. Uh, yes. In fact, you need to go to Iceland for a good example of how to live full stop because they got rid of the bankers, they slapped the politicians around, and they've got a good entry every time we've got Eurovision Song Contest. Iceland it is all the way from me. Lanzarote, unfortunately, is very poor. Considering completely that we've agree. Got, uh, <laughs> considering we've got year-round sun, um, it was actually illegal for people to have uh, private um, solar panels until a very short while ago. Yeah, we're, we're, we're oh. crap. We don't... Lanzarote is, is black. The fields are covered with a pecan, which is the volcanic... It's crushed volcanic stone. And what it does is trap a layer of water and it prevents it from evaporating into the air. Now, two years ago, uh, there was a volcanic, volcanic eruption in La Palma. And basically, the earth supplied enough material, enough pecan, to go around the rest of the islands. Our sister island, Fuerteventura, doesn't have a field of pecan on it. You could make Fuerteventura into a into a green island by sharing out the resources. We don't share out the resources. We stick a flag in it and say, "No, this is a this is a reserve of the biosphere, and this is for tourists to look at." We could be a lot better. Unfortunately, Lanzarote is not a good example. Yeah, yeah. Is it is it because is it because decisions are coming from Madrid? Not really. Decisions are coming from politicians, and it doesn't matter where politicians are from. At the end of the day, it's back pocket for the length of their uh, tenure. It's not for the good of the planet. And actually, the the um, kind of physical distance that we have from mainland Europe actually translates into distance from lots of kind of European policies and things that are seen as European standard aren't necessarily standard in the Canaries. Um, some things appear very good, like the recycling here is very good. 
but I'm not sure that anybody's entirely convinced that recycling actually gets recycled, for example. Um, so there's, yeah, like Ed's um, just explained, it it has potential in that it's got, you know, it's got all sorts of things that you could potentially use to make it, you know, very sustainable, but it's not actually being run in that way. Um, only one of the Canary Islands that I have knowledge of being kind of actively working towards this is Eliero, who during, I think it was last year or the year before, um, ran entirely on sustainable energy sources for a period of three months, kind of proved that they could do that throughout the year um, and that that is what they were going to aim for. They were going to use other sources only as a kind of like emergency backup for surges and things like this. Um, and they also have really kind of high quality public transport, particularly for the size of the island. And if you compare it to somewhere like here, <laughs> where we have buses like every three hours. Um, so, so yeah, so I think it has potential, but I don't think that that is being tapped into at the minute, unfortunately. Yeah, it's an unwillingness to invest finance in the future. And until we actually change that um, desire to live in, a big house with a big car in general, I'm afraid we're all headed down the same cul-de-sac. And on that cheery note, let's sing a song. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. um, I yeah. have another artist question, if we would like to move on to something less kind of sad. Yeah? Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, so this comes from Armando Rotondi, who is um, an, a returning artist to, to the festivals. Um, and also this year is one of our volunteer team who has um, designed and edited the catalogue, which is launching tomorrow. Just a little push for that to go in there. Um, and it was when he was talking about um, the process of designing the catalogue that this question came to him. Um, and it's really around um, artistic practice. So the question is, is metamorphosis for you a part of the input, the process or the output, or is it something that happens throughout? I would say all of the above. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's before before the conception, the process and the product. Yeah, I don't, yeah, it's all like a complete whole. Yeah, just think about when you start to create something and the end product. Is it what you really, really imagined how it would look like? Because for me, it's usually, never what I originally imagined really? and I think this is part of method or this could be the part of metamorphosis or, or like the whole process well the art is metamorphosis is, 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 is a lot better than that but it could be said I agree yeah exactly <laughs> And maybe that's the thing with corporate art, that it's kind of dead. It's not really about change. Mm -hmm. So where I live, there are a lot of galleries because there are a lot of tourists. And it's true, people don't necessarily want something in their living room that's like depressing or whatever. But man, there are a lot of paintings of flowers and cows. And that's what people buy because that's, that's what they think art is. So I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, in my sorry, in my own practice, um, you know, as artists, we get told to be like marketable, um, to stay with one particular style and not to change, and all that sort of stuff. I've always wanting to be fluid, wanting to go with that, you know, flow of whatever wants to come up in that moment to just to just be. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, and as we change, our art should change. Well, I'm not here to say that it should, but, you know, we should yeah. allow. <laughs> yeah. Just look at Madonna. I mean, come on. <laughs> How true, yes. 
I was just going to say that I was talking to a friend today and I was thinking about, you know, monitorizing, yeah, my kind of skills, I suppose, and thinking about my studio. And actually, I don't, I don't do in my studio, I have it as a space, just a space just to kind of think and to try out different ideas and um and there the the idea of metamorphosizing kind of whatever it is i'm looking at a piece of material and i'm changing it and doing things to it and then i'll pick up something else and do something else and it's just a space to do that in and that is a luxury i know um but that is what that is the process for me Mm. I love the humour, by the way. It's all about change. I mean, nothing is static. People imagine it is, but it isn't and it shouldn't be. So we have to write it. And when we hold on to that, you know, trying for things to be permanent all the time, that's when we suffer, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. If we realize things are going to change, you know, externally, internally, um, but, you know, allowing for ourselves to go in a more positive direction, I think, uh, controlling some change, but realizing we can't control others, you know. Could I potentially take um, Host's rights and, and ask my question? Would that be okay? Yes, yeah, please. <laughs> Um, so something that I've been thinking about a lot, um, I'll just give a little bit of context because otherwise it, it kind of makes no sense. So since I had COVID in March 2022, I've been chronically ill and in fact was registered as disabled um, because of the, the long lasting impact that the virus has had on me. And it really kind of opened my eyes to the, um, the inaccessibility of the art world for professionals. Like asking for accommodations as a professional artist is almost impossible, um, which seems in contrast with the way that artists are kind of leading the way actually and being so adaptable and being so flexible in making accommodations for participants and audience members. Um, and so this is a way that I feel like the the art world um, needs to metamorphose in the future. Like, I feel like there's a lot of work to be done around accessibility. Um, and, you know, I'm running some, some talks and doing some blogs and kind of trying to get something started around that. So my question to you is about what's important, I guess, to you, um, and how do you think the art world needs to change in the future for the better? I think, but I it's it's maybe a pipe dream. Um, when I, I started out hanging out in the art world, there were a lot of margins. There were, was a lot of room for different kinds of things. And we would organize events in a range of venues, including bars and all kinds of things. And what I have seen is that, and I've seen this in other fields too, that because of the star system, there can only be one winner and then everybody else doesn't have a chance. You can't exhibit, you can't do anything. And I think that that's like death to creativity. So I think that we have to work to make space for stuff that might not sell or the artist might not be an international art star to make money for the dealers um, and just to have some flexibility about that. I also agree with you about accessibility. I have long COVID, it's been four months now and um, also I'm older, right? And so I, I realize people are really uneasy around illness. They don't like it. It's like you're a downer or something. And I think that has to change everywhere because none of us are gonna get out with a, get out alive, you know? So, so I think just an openness to people either because of accessibility or for other reasons who aren't immediately going to be like big art stars would make things much much nicer for all of us. I agree. I think the the para, you know, that kind of that image of the sort of genius artist that's sort of sitting 
you know, on, on this kind of talent that no one else could possibly have because this person was just born with this incredible sort of, uh, you know, genius um, is so excluding. And and also um, these big institutions that talk about inclusion and actually the system isn't inclusive because it's set up on that paradigm, that, that kind of system is set up on that, the one genius person that is, you know, yeah, one genius person that everyone kind of looks up at, and so that's about sep- sep- separate, you know, set being separate. And uh, the the new paradigm is about really, you know, everyone taking up and 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 taking their their space and taking and being inspired to no matter what age, uh, uh, you know, uh, physical ability, making it accessible for everyone and everyone standing up and sharing, sharing when we are having, I'm a, um, an artist of age, you know, and I've got grey hair and, um, you know, I've also uh, have uh, an underactive thyroid, so I've got a hidden disability um, and, you know, there's... Yeah, I could choose to be invisible, but I'm pushing myself out of my comfort zone. Um, And it's not always easy because the industry, when I look at, you know, Instagram and I see contemporaries that I have exhibited with in the past, like Tracy Emin and people like that with the huge numbers of followers. And I can feel like as soon as I see that, I feel like, oh, you know, um, it's impossible. I think uh, it. It, we have to inspire each other and, n- and know that, that there's space for everyone. There is space for everyone. There's plenty of space out there in this industry and, um, and support each other, actually. And I think that's what Lacuna is doing in a small way. Um, and um, just just supporting each other, seeing each other's work, encouraging each other, building community in that way. Yeah. Yeah, I would like to add the importance of collaborations and discussions. I believe what we are doing right now can be the part of the future of the art world because I think we are discussing very meaningful topics. And if we can put these meanings into art, that's already worth it for me. So if we can put um, the message out there, I think that's the main aim for art. If you ask yes. Me. This is what's so great about Lacuna. You know, I sometimes I go by how I feel in a situation. Like if I go to a show someplace, do I feel depressed or whatever? But everything to do with Lacuna this year and last year, I feel things opening up. I feel possibilities. It's interesting. It's interesting to have been organizing this discussion. It's interesting seeing the other work. And I'd like I the fact that Lacuna insists on inclusivity and on getting people together. Like it was Lacuna who asked the three of us if we'd like to work together. We didn't know each other before. We're in different countries. It's a wonderful thing. And I agree with you, Marton. It has to be the future of where we're going because we have to enjoy our lives, you know. Yeah, and just also stepping out of our comfort zones and even trying out mediums we've not tried out before. I don't know, Ed, do you have anything to add there? Inclusivity is what it's all about at the end of the day. And unfortunately, uh, I'm going to go all heavy and societal again. I mean, at the end, it, it, you, you push people into a position of, of craving success and, uh, and and all the joy that comes with being able to create for, for money. It kind of takes away some of the uh, some of the spontaneity, doesn't it? I mean, are we going back into like the, the the AI discussion again? Is it like we we you see somebody create something, create one work of art, and all of a sudden a million people try and duplicate that piece of work of art to make a few spondulies? I mean, look at the uh, uh, the guy, the graffiti chap, who's away spraying on all the walls all over the place, Banksy. I mean, is his art any more valid than something we see on the wall here? Okay. But also, it's a very good question because he's also selling works for money. But then he also had the system when he 
like you know, just drain down his worth when it was auctioned. Mm -hmm. In his case, well, that, this is a little bit crazy paradox of the art world. You've got somebody who's anti who's anti establishment, who's basically calling out for the for the rights, left, right, and center of everybody, and yet paradoxically, he's the richest artist in the world. What's what's That's going on? And he has a very good PR who I know, and uh, she she gets some really good deals for him, and she gets him in good places, and. Yeah, it's it's an industry. It's an industry. And you're absolutely right. You know, who's to say that, that his work is any different and better or worse than, than another graffiti artist? It's the industry. It's being able to get people behind you, money, moneyed people that kind of um, then turn it into a big kind of, yeah, it becomes a kind of industry and it moves away from the, this natural kind of sense of like, creating for creation for creation's sake you know being able to create things thinking differently yeah i think this is this is a really important um part of the ethos behind the lacuna festivals like we see art as having an intrinsic value to us as artists but also to wider society you know a value that's beyond money it's more it's so much more important than its monetary um kind of assignment by the commercial um capitalist society it's something that yeah is like as a human like the desire to create is one of the strongest and earliest urges in in you know infant development and it feels like it kind of gets very much usurped and squashed by this um drive and desire for money um so and this is why we have you know we don't charge for participation we don't take commission we don't um have venues that charge us money we we try and keep everything um cashless you know like our, our workshops are given generously by artists for artists and other people who are interested in art um and we do it because we love it and because we want other people to love it and you know we don't want that to always be about money money kind of kills stuff you know it really and I felt I feel that really really strongly throughout my own practice I I really have to balance the amount of paid work that I do where I'm asked to specifically create something and the work that I do for myself because I want to create, you know, I want to do what it is that I want to do. Um, yeah, I'm going to stop again before I ramble because I, I really, when I get on my soapbox about this, I can really go off on one. Um, but yeah. But it's important. Yes, I think so. I think, I think that, well, I think some people, I think so strongly, and I think some people think so, but there are a lot of artists who um, won't be involved in the festivals and are very vocal about their opposition to the festivals because there's no monetary assignment to anything, you know, so artists don't get paid for the work that they're doing. Um, there's no way to particularly make money out of the the festivals and they see that as being a really negative thing and again I can't like I do understand where where that opinion is coming from because particularly when I was kind of new to the freelance world it was how you developed like you went and did work portfolio work for free because otherwise you just couldn't build your portfolio and it's it's not ethical and it's not just and it's not fair and I don't believe that that's the the way the art world should work um but that's within that commercial capitalized system like this is external from that and I hope that people well I mean I think that you understand that but I don't know how to kind of spread that further you know without the money coming back into it In Canada, we have artist-run centers, so so they get some government funding, way less than they used to, but they get some, 
and it's artist evaluation um, of other work and then they mount shows and have space and stuff. And I think that made things quite interesting because it was completely outside of the art market system. And it was the way for younger artists or emerging artists to um, have a have a exhibition history and so forth. Yeah, we're part yeah. of um, an artist run network, um, which is all about artist led and directed spaces. Um, and as we announced relatively recently on our social media, we are taking a whole bunch of artworks that's been donated to the Lacuna Festivals over the, the five years we've been running to Denmark for an exhibition um, at Juxtapose Art Fair, which is a, an art fair, again, not about making money, about supporting artist-led spaces and about connecting artist-led spaces together so that we can collaborate and share information and all sorts of amazing things come out of these these networks, you know? I mean, just one example is the Artist Run Resource Center, which is like this online resource where you can find, I mean, all sorts of stuff, you know? Um, I can see from your face, Deborah, that you might be interested in that so I can drop a link. Um, <laughs> yeah. Are we ready to conclude? Or are there any questions that you want to ask? I just think it's a shame we're not all in the same place and can go for a drink now, I see. <laughs> I know, I wish we could. <laughs> yeah, maybe this could be as well the future of the art world. I think we forgot this instance that we are doing this online and there's also a huge potential in this. But it would be better to be at the same place. I agree. Yeah, your place next week then. <laughs> Come on in. Everyone on the plane to Budapest. Well, we want to thank everyone who participated. And certainly we want to thank Lacuna for creating the venue in which this was possible. The three of us have certainly found it very, very interesting. And it's been wonderful to meet you, Ed. And I wish I could sit down with you and talk for like five hours. <laughs> um, but thank you so much yeah likewise thanks for connecting us all and yeah for myself it's been an amazing few months talking with Deborah and Martin like it's expanded my knowledge and it's really nice to connect with people that are like-minded as well and fellow artists as artists we're usually locked away in our room in our houses and it's yeah it's good to be part of a community all across the world so yeah thank you so much and thank you for everyone for coming as well and ed thank you <laughs> yeah yeah but big kudos for everyone thanks for the collaboration sharing thoughts yeah thank you when i applied to the festival i i never thought that this discussion would like end up this good yeah <laughs> And I think um, that we also have to say thank you to to you for putting in so much effort. You know, you all submitted an idea about how you would like to have a discussion about about the theme with other artists, and that's why I, I put you in contact. Um, but really, you have directed this and and led this entirely independently of me. You know, and the festivals you've gone and you've researched and you've contacted Ed and you've come up with the, all of these thoughts and structures. Um, and so we really appreciate the, the time and energy that you've put into this. I think it's generated some really interesting ideas and thoughts. Um, and I have no doubt that we will be seeing a lot more comments and questions coming through once we um, go live on the YouTube channel. So thank you so much for all of that. Um, and of course, there's always a chance for us all to be in the same place next year come here for the festivals next year make it a plan <laughs> thank you so much everybody thank you thank yeah. you all thank you guys